We've been here before, fighting the problems that fight back. But we can shift the status quo, because we see opportunities where others see obstacles. We're change makers and problem solvers, uniting over one million minds to address complex issues facing communities around the world, including yours. With passion and purpose, we've led the efforts to put an end to polio. Now eradication isn't just possible, it's plausible. Every day we're investing in a new generation of leaders so we can continue to provide access to clean water, tackle global health concerns, support education, and build the foundations of peace across borders. We're working together as partners and professionals while making friendships that last a lifetime. We're Rotary, and there's no limit to what we can do. Welcome everyone to the Rotary Club of Tulsa. I'm so glad to see you all. We have a great, informative, educational, and timely program for you today, and I know you're going to enjoy it. For our start, we will have Daniel Ketchum uh, give the invocation and lead us in the pledge. We will not sing today because we have a musical guest who would uh, certainly show uh, the inadequacy of our vocal skills if we try to sing, so we will not. We will have the invocation and the pledge, and then Joy Longmire will introduce our visitors. So Daniel, if you'll make your way up for the invocation, we'll get started. Uh, please join me in prayer. Creator, God, and sustainer of life, thank you for this glorious spring day, for the brilliant blooming flowers and trees that remind us of new life and renewal, for the warm sun and longer days that fill us with promise and energy, and for the spring rains that bring nourishing water, vital to all living things. Springtime also brings stormy weather, and we pray for healing, comfort, and recovery for those who are injured and lost homes, property, and places of worship in last Wednesday's tornado. This day, our club uh, welcomes leaders of the city's Hispanic community, and we look forward to learning about this vibrant community's contribution to the city's rich diversity, spirited culture, and the growing economy. Thank you for their leadership, courage, and contributions to their community and to the whole. May we have open hearts and minds as we hear from them today. May we be eager to learn something new and about someone new, putting aside any preconceptions and what, of what we may have thought or heard about our brothers and sisters in this community who, have li who live and work among us. We're grateful for the food that we'll share at lunch today with our fellow Rotarians and guests gathered around our common value of service above self. Lead us as we continue great efforts to serve and seek new ways to exercise this gift from you. In your holy name, amen. If you'll join me in the pledge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sorry about that. Come on. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians and guests. Daniel, you forgot the pledge, and you also forgot the moment of silence for Ed Monette and the Sooners. Just saying. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest today, and as always, will the guest and their host Rotarian please stand when your names are announced, and as always, we will hold our applause until all have been announced. Thank you. Wayne Pope is a guest of Roger Dunham. Wayne is in the mortgage lending business. And you all know this name because his name is on an envelope you get at the end of December. Dennis Semler, this Tulsa County Treasurer, here with Michael Wallace. A new member, Andy Avila, is starting things off right by bringing a guest, Will Lopez, with PricewaterhouseCoopers, a numbers man. 
Michael Jones, who's also a visiting Rotarian, and we'll recognize that later, has his wife Jennifer Jones here with Seed Technologies. Our sweet little exchange student, Belen Portugal, is here with Alicia and with her host mother, Catherine DeCamp. Trish Kirkstra, Kirkstra uh, who's, as we know, with Post Oak Lodge, has one of her colleagues here today, James Ernst. And Joe O'Connor with San Miguel School is here with John, I understand. Brothers, is that right? Very good. He's my father. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's good. <laughs> John also has another guest here today, Tom Flanagan who's a commercial realtor with Marcus Millichap. And Kim Cook is the lovely daughter of our very own Bob Sade. Let's give a round of applause for our visitors. And we do have some visiting Rotarians today from the Sand Springs Club, Father Clark Shackelford. Hi, Clark. From Rotaract is Hunter, I think it's Mattix. <laughs> there we go. And Ben Gorell is here from Southside. Hi, Ben. And as I mentioned, Michael Jones, a, a Rotarian from Southside, who's also an attorney, is here. Hi, Michael. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming to uh, visit us today, and please know you are always welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. As I discussed last week, the next uh, three weeks, including today, we'll be hearing special music uh, from youth that are being uh, trained in our community and that will represent us. Today, you will be hearing from Alexandra Coppinger. She was born here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and has been involved in music from an early age. She received piano lessons from the Janelle Whitby School of Music from age four through 18, received cello lessons for many years, and has been a member of her church choirs, performed specials with her family and church, and excelled in Tulsa Youth Opera during her high school years. Upon graduation from home school, she was offered a teaching position at the Janelle Whitby School of Music, started her own catering business, and was accepted as a Tulsa Opera Chorus member. She has been in 13 Tulsa Opera productions and will be performing with the company in their production of Samson and Delilah this May. She currently studies with phenomenal soprano and vocal teacher Susanna Brooks of Tulsa. I'd also like to let you know that Alexandra has been accepted into the New York Lyric Opera Summer Program in New York City this summer. There she will receive training from some of the top musicians in the field and has the opportunity to sing in front of agents as well as perform at Lincoln Center and Carnegie Hall. She is currently doing a fundraising program so that she can raise funds to make the trip and be a part of this awesome endeavor. As chair of the Crescendo Music Committee, if any of my fellow Rotarians would like to support her efforts, and after hearing her today, I'm sure that you will, please make contact with me, either by cell or email, and I will definitely get you in contact with her. Today, she is accompanied by her mother, Sherry Coppinger. She will be performing two arias. The first is Je dis que rien ne m'épouvant from Carmen by Georges Bizet, and Still Me, Sweet Thief from The Old Maid and the Thief by Giancarlo Minotti. Please give a warm Rotarian welcome to Alexandria Coppinger.
Alexandria, fantastic. I almost got the courage to join in. <laughs> I'm totally kidding about that, obviously. For our Phones Out Take Notes segment, we like to remind you of our upcoming programs. Next week, Malcolm McCollum will be here to tell us all about Tulsa Tough, the program that's putting Tulsa on the map in terms of bike racing. After that, the next week, we will have Ryan Garko, who's the manager of the Drillers. I cannot wait for that. I am a big baseball guy. <clears throat> and David Irving, who is the coach of the Tulsa Roughnecks, who will be here to tell us about Tulsa's teams. On the 21st, the next day, <clears throat> don't forget the Tulsa Rotor Act wine, cheese, and chocolate function is the next evening. And you probably noticed there is a booth out in the hallway, and there will be out uh, after the meeting today. And we're glad to have our Rotor Act guests here, and I hope that you will all support their event. It's very fun, trust me. Uh, on the 23rd, which is a Saturday, uh, the BY's Immunize event is out at the zoo. I believe it starts at 10 a.m., and if you have an interest in participating in that great event, I encourage you to contact Jeffrey Rudd. Uh, who can give you some more details about how to spend, wisely spend a few hours on a Saturday. And then the last reminder on April 27th at our program here, we will, let, we will turn things over to Camp Enterprise and hear all about how it went. So mark your calendars now and plan to be at those programs. A reminder of our committee meeting today, committee meetings I should say, the budget committee will meet in room 232 and the yearling service project class two group will meet in room two, I'm sorry, this is 232 both times. I believe the budget's in 233, actually. The typo is on the screen. It's upstairs. You guys know where to go. <laughs> Just go and find your people and have your meeting. Uh, Alicia, who are we recognizing today as our sponsors of the program? Thanks, Alicia. It's always a pleasure to have new member introductions, and so I'll invite our new members and their Rotarian hosts, sponsors, to come up. As they're making their way up, I'll remind all of you, like I do every time we have new members, to make our new members, Raymond and Melon, feel comfortable and appreciated, and most importantly, put them to work. That's the best way to welcome them to Rotary. So who's first? Trey, you're first. Come on up and introduce us. Thank you, 
sir. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome Mr. Raymond Jones to our ranks today. Raymond has managed his family's oil and gas business for the past 30 years, as well as being heavily involved in Habitat for Humanity, uh, different healthcare organizations that he's volunteered in, as well as volunteering with his church. Raymond's primary drive behind Rotary is to find new avenues of service that he can get involved with within the community. Raymond's classification will be petroleum production, oil and gas. Raymond, I'd like to present you with your four-way test and your Rotary pin. Please help me in greeting Raymond to our club. Fellow Rotarians, it's a distinct honor and pleasure to welcome back to Tulsa Rotary, Rotary Malin Pitt, a friend and business colleague. He was born in St. John's Hospital, attended TU, became an accountant at uh, Arthur Young, remember Arthur Young, and later on has had a distinguished career in several businesses, moved to Charlotte, North Carolina after he was a member here, and is now back in Tulsa as managing partner for Triax, a uh, brokerage firm that buys and sells and restructures companies. Malin, great to have you back in Tulsa. Thank you. Thank you, guys, and thank you, Trey and Scott, for sponsoring these new members. A reminder, this may be the last one, I don't know, that uh, Jerry and DJ are here to take photographs right out there in Parker Hall. That's why you see that mysterious curtain, so that when you're smiling really big for the camera, no one can see you but Jerry, if that embarrasses you. Um, but there are a few of you whose pictures are a little bit on the rustic side if you know what I mean. So why don't you consider getting your picture remade if you have halfway decent clothes on so we can get, uh, have you in the directory looking like you really <laughs> appear. Those of you who don't have halfway decent clothes on know who I'm talking about. Uh, I understand that Camp Enterprise was outstanding last week, so a big bravo and thank you to the volunteers who participated. And if you did, please stand. And like I said earlier, we will hear all about it in a few weeks. And also a reminder to remember your fireside sessions that start next week. If you've signed up, you'll be getting notice and information from the office, and I encourage you to attend because your host, Rotarian for your fireside, is putting out a lot of effort, of course, to make you feel welcome. All right, Alicia, it's time for our Sarge segment. Make sure your microphone's on. To work the microphone over there so sorry about that hi good afternoon um first and foremost we have a very big happy birth nothing's on darn it help me out miguel thank you let's go back happy birthday to scott philstrup where are you happy birthday scott <laughs> Scott, thank you very much for your contribution to Bob McKenzie's Ride Across America. <coughs> Are you going to wear a big t-shirt with Scott's picture on it? Is that your plan? T-shirt, Scott's picture? I guess not. Okay. <laughs> Camp Enterprise was fantastic. If you guys didn't make it, you need to make an effort next year. Um, that's Jarl. Does everybody know Jarl? Jarl, are you here somewhere? I see you back there. This is Jarl. Year after year, Jarl is so much fun at Camp Enterprise, and this year he was getting ready to go down the zip line with Tim, and Tim graciously contributed $200 to let us watch this quick little video. So I'm like, I haven't seen this yet, I'm excited. <laughs> I think he's screaming right here, you just can't hear him. <laughs> Ooh, that's fantastic. Thank you, Tim and Jarl. <laughs> Very, very much. Uh, real quick, while we're talking about Tim, Tim has some tickets. Um, he's got a table at the Habitat for Humanity Steel Toes and Stilettos. I have no idea what that entails, but if you would like to go, what was that? Oh, sorry. Um, see Tim Knoll, or you can see Rochelle in the office. Okay. 
business booths outside. If you're here with a business booth, would you stand so we can give you a quick round of applause and thank you. Thank you to everybody that contributes to make that such a success. Um, if you bought a book from Martin Keating out there, he donated all the money to the Rotary Foundation, so thank you, Martin, for that. If you didn't get a book, he gave me one, and I'll charge you three times more than what he was selling them for if you really want one, so see me. Um, and next week, Jason George with the Tulsa Drillers, Marty Alexander with World Travel, and Stu McDaniel with Guru Stu, so it should be great. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Alicia. Well, since we're having an interview panel today, we will dispense with the normal Rotarian of the day, and such as it is, I will serve in that role. And we're going to be pretty informal, and I will encourage the audience to ask questions too, but I have uh, spent some time with the panelists uh, getting some uh, um, ideas to them about questions that we would ask and topics that we would cover. But again, I want to encourage you in the audience, so anyone who has a question, raise your hand, get our attention, and we'll be glad to have you participate as well. I also asked the panel, instead of a person like me introducing them, I asked them if they would be willing to do a short introduction of themselves. I know everybody's always a little shy about doing that, but they graciously agreed. So, Jesse, if you'll grab your microphone and uh, turn it on and tap it to make sure it's working. We're, we're technologically challenged here always. Then I would love you to start and just tell us a little bit about you before we get started. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. This is an honor. And to follow that, man, that was incredible. So, well done. Um, I am uh, going on 19 years with the Tulsa Police Department. I'm originally from uh, New Mexico, born and raised out there. I was recruited out there, back out, out of New Mexico, out this direction in the mid-90s. And at that time, uh, they only had eight Hispanic officers on the Tulsa Police Department. So uh, I've been very fortunate and blessed to be part of the Tulsa community for 19 years. And as I say, if you spent more time here than you spent in high school somewhere else, you might as well consider yourself from Oklahoma. So go Cowboys, for those of you in the... Uh, <laughs> um, I went to grad school there, so I uh, have my heart right there. Um, what I do for the Tulsa Police Department is I'm the uh, recruiting coordinator for the police, so I travel throughout the country looking for the best and the brightest to come work for the Tulsa Police Department, uh, as well as I'm an instructor at the academy and uh, the director of Hispanic Outreach for the, uh, the PD. Um, more would you like me to pass it down? No, I'll let you pass it and we'll okay. get All more. Right. Yes. We'll go from there. Where's the karaoke machine? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, my name is Francisco Trevino. I'm uh, Jesse Guardiola's bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> they call me the president of the Tulsa Hispanic Chamber. I was one of the founders back in uh, 99, and uh, in 2006, the position opened. They asked me to apply. They gave me the job. They haven't fired me since. Uh, I was born. <laughs> you can laugh if you want to. <laughs> uh, the next joke could be five bucks. Um, I was born in Monterey, Mexico back in 67. Um, uh, 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 I came to the United States in, uh, when I was 11. Uh, I came straight to Tulsa in 1978. I've been living in Tulsa since then, and so I've seen the growth of the Hispanic uh, community. Uh, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is the ugly right here. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, I, I think that's, that's pretty much it. I'm pretty brief. Thank you, Francisco. Hello, everybody. My name is Andy Chapa. Uh, I was uh, born in McAllen, Texas, and moved up here 15 years ago. Tulsa is the place to live in. And uh, since then, have been working for Arvis Bank uh, as the Hispanic Business Coordinator. Basically, what I do at Arvis Bank is connect with the community, find out what their financial needs are, and help those businesses grow. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So let's show our appreciation for them being here. So, gentlemen, before we start, I don't mean to tower over you standing here, but I want to pretend like I'm Megan Kelly. So, except I'm going to ask easy questions instead of tough ones. And anyway, I, I thought I would start with this one uh, because it just, if, maybe it's my training. I want to know what we're talking about, who we're talking about. And so the question that popped in my mind is, and any of you can answer this one, what, what, 
what is a Hispanic person? You were talking about a community. What do you have to be to be a Hispanic person that's considered part of the Hispanic community? What's your heritage, et cetera? Tell us a little bit about that. What are, what are people talking about when they talk about a Hispanic person? There we go. Okay. Uh, when teaching at the police academy, one of the things that I try to cover for them, because this question is asked a lot, what is the difference between a Hispanic and a Latino? Um, and is it, is it okay to call somebody Latino or Mexican? Um, and I explain to them, of, of course, but it just depends on the, the, the origin and the, and the way you're using it. And what I mean by that, when you're using the word Latino, it deals with Latin America. And Hispanic is a term that uh, President Reagan in the 80s he had made the decision that I'm not going to put 22 Latin American countries on a voter ID or a government form, so I'm going to look at it from the origin of the language, which was Spain. And that's where he brought in uh, the word Hispanic to cover languages that speak Spanish. And uh, so the government uses Hispanic. We also use Latino. Um, Chicano is more of a uh, West Coast and then you hear more Latino on the East Coast. Well, I mean, I've been called Hispanic, I've been called Latino, I've been called bad things before, too. <laughs> uh, I, to be honest with me, I mean, I, I, uh, in the Hispanic community, I mean, I think uh, b being Hispanic is, is being proud of your heritage. Uh, and and when, whenever the pe people see the Hispanic community in, in, in like, for example, East Tulsa, uh, they kind of tend to stay close. Uh, they're very family-oriented, uh, hardworking, very passionate about uh, entrepreneur, uh, so about opening a business, you know. So to me, I mean, uh, you know, Jesse kind of gave a good uh, uh, thing about the, the being Hispanic or Latino, but I, I like to be called Hispanic instead of Latino. So, don't, so if, you, if you call me Mexican, I, I, I don't get mad either. <laughs> So, Andy, I know your office is uh, 51st and Garnett, is that right? That is correct. So, does that tip us off that maybe that's a sort of the Hispanic community might have a uh, location or a center near that area? Well, um, from 51st going north, it is considered uh, a Hispanic uh, area, 51st all the way to 11th, that's East Tulsa, and obviously North Tulsa would be considered a, uh, a geographic area for that community. So Francisco, you said a minute ago that one of the characteristics of the Hispanic community is their close families. Are there some other uh, things about the Hispanic community that you think sets them apart from other communities uh, like that? Well, they're, they're most of them, I think most of the Hispanic community is first generation. And, uh, Did so you say which generation? First generation. First generation, okay. Uh, the new, newly arrived, uh, um, uh, Hispanics from other Central Americas uh, in Mexico. Um, what they want is a better life. Uh, they want to uh, live the American dream. Uh, a lot of them come here to, to better themselves and better their lives. And if they have relatives in Mexico or South America, they want to better their lives as well by sending money to Mexico and working hard here. So interesting that you mentioned that most of the members of the Hispanic community are first generation. I wouldn't have known that. So is that um, backed by survey data or just general knowledge? What's I stand in the corner and just count how many Mexicans yeah. there are. Yeah. That's how I figure it out. Yeah. The, uh, the, the U.S. Census says that, uh, and just to speak of the children, the U.S. Census says that 89 percent of Hispanic uh, kids are U.S. citizens. So, and that's a misnomer. A lot of people assume that many of the kids that you see are undocumented or are not uh, resident aliens, and when in fact that almost 90% of them are U.S. citizens or born or naturalized here. Very interesting. So, Andy, in the, in the banking arena, you said, tell us again a little bit about your specific job uh, description at the bank, your specific sure. task. Uh, several years ago, I believe it was 15 years ago, um, we saw the growth in the Hispanic community here in Tulsa. Uh, we wanted to see what we needed to do to service those needs. Uh, and it was interesting, uh, the first thing that came to our mind was, well, let's just do what we're doing in the general population and translate that information to Spanish. And bingo, there you go. Well, come to find out, uh, we needed to find out what their financial needs were. In our mind, we're thinking, what's the 
this is 15 years ago, what's the bank that has the higher interest rate on deposit accounts? Uh, that was not what they were thinking about. They're thinking, how can I send money back to my loved ones in my country of origin? Another thing is, what do I need to do to buy my house? Where can I find information uh, to uh, educate myself as far as what is a consumer loan? What is a mortgage loan? What's the difference between those two? So by being able to identify those things, we concentrated our efforts in identifying those needs and educating the population on those needs. Well, and then to add to that, uh, when I first came here in the late 90s, you had a huge concentration of Hispanics at the Fifth and Lewis area around uh, TU um, in those apartment complexes. What you have found is most of those families have now moved out of those apartment complexes and have moved into homes that have purchased around the Pine and Harvard, Apache and Harvard area, therefore making that area uh, heavy, heavy Hispanic. And you, you see the transition from that I get here, I uh, make enough money to where I can afford to purchase my first home and therefore move into a home in that area. What about the, the drivers of the economy in the Hispanic community? Are there some differences or some things you're seeing in those, either Francisco or Andia, that you're uh, seeing in the community that might well, be worth it, mentioning? You know, I, I believe it's important. We have to keep in mind we're talking about individuals that uh, have overcome uh, tremendous uh, adversity moving to the United States. Uh, with that, uh, they, many of them, were entrepreneurs back in their countries of origin. Uh, and uh, just think about being a small business owner in an environment where costs, or the, biz the cost of doing business is always going up. Here in the States, fuel costs fluctuate. Latin America, they don't. They always go up and up. So they're uh, used to those adversities. They come to the states with a natural ability to overcome adversity. Uh, working in an environment where uh, there's tremendous pressure on the business profits. So uh, I believe that to be a tremendous driver in being a successful Hispanic business owner. Also, the ability to identify opportunities uh, Opportunities that to many of us here may seem small or insignificant, but they're able to take those opportunities and make those opportunities profitable. So those are the two main drivers that we're seeing uh, happen within the Hispanic business owners. So Francisco, that kind of makes me think of asking you a little bit about the Chamber of Commerce and tell us a bit about its uh, goals and missions and think that sort of well, stuff. Uh, well, I think the, the Hispanic Chamber kind of plays a role of, as, as being the bridge between the Hispanic and the non-Hispanic um, businesses. Uh, try to be the bridge. For example, there's a lot of Hispanic businesses that only do business with the Hispanic community, which they're missing out on 85 cents of that dollars that that's, that's out there. Um, a lot of them are getting smart, for example, uh, uh, providing products that uh, not just Hispanics use, uh, but that, that the whole community, in a way, a lot of them are starting advertising in English radio station, English television, instead of just Spanish television. Uh, they know that, that catering to the, the whole market is going to better their business here in Tulsa. And uh, one of the things that the, the chamber does is try to be that bridge. Uh, and with uh, entrepreneurs, uh, we, we like to try to get them to start with the right foot. You know, if they, if they want to open a business, well, this is the process that we do here in, in the state of Oklahoma to register your business. And then we utilize them, the resources that we have. Uh, I, I noticed that one of the questions you had is how do we work with the Tulsa Regional Chamber? Well, we work very well with the Tulsa Regional Chamber because we utilize some of the resources that they have in order to help our members as well. And, uh, and then we don't just encourage them to, you know, to, to become members of other chambers. Uh, at first I thought maybe perhaps uh, uh, chambers didn't work, but I've, I've seen it. The chambers do work in the community. We just saw the work uh, of Vision yesterday uh, here in Tulsa, which I think is going to make Tulsa really, really, I sound like Trump, really great. It's going to make <laughs> Tulsa great. But, uh, but I, I, you know, we, we try to help out as much as we can, especially to the new entrepreneur that, that wants to open a business. 
And do you do you have many non-Hispanic businesses who make contact with you, kind of looking for the other oh, yeah, direction yeah, as well? Out of uh, 285 members that we have, uh, I think maybe about 35 percent are Hispanic-owned businesses, mom and pops, and and then the rest will be non-Hispanic corporations like Arvest. Right. Right. So how about my, how about some of the business practices that you see in the Hispanic community and and uh, exporting those to others? Great ideas you've seen or practices you've seen? Do you you know, I, I, the Hispanic community is m maturing a little bit in, in, in the way they do business. Uh, you know, at first, you know, okay, well, I'm going to open a construction company. Uh, but then all of a sudden, you know, if they do well in that company, I've, I've, I've had people that come to me and said, I want to open a liquor store. What, what, you know, what can I do to get this thing going? And then the, that's how we got started. They, they, in a way, they're growing up, working, uh, owning a construction company, but now they're looking in other venues to maybe perhaps invest their money. You know, and, and, and I've, I've seen um, that American dream uh, uh, in, in a lot of the business owners. I mean, there's one business owner that got here when he was about 18, 17 or 18, picking corn in Bixby. Uh, now he's, he owns several car dealers, and he owns uh, several properties, and uh, so you know that to me that's that's a drive, you know the motivation of, of better than themselves. So the the I think Andy mentioned of course that people moved here for a better life, and I assume that what quote unquote a better life means can be different depending on the circumstances that people are leaving. But is the American dream? A part of that, I mean, do people looking at America from Latin American countries and and wanting to come here? Part of it is part of it the American dream. What what we kind of think of as the American dream is that part of the better life they're looking at, or is it just safety and comfort and and uh, and just safer living conditions, or is it the American dream, or some of both? I think it, uh, Jeff, it's part of both. Uh, if we're to see uh, the growth that we've had here in Tulsa uh, within the Hispanic population, uh, it's interesting to see this change of mindset where before you would talk to individuals or families and their goal was to work here maybe five, ten years and go back home. Uh, what they didn't take in consideration in that thought was their children are growing up here. Their school is Tulsa. Their friends are in Tulsa. Their church is in Tulsa. So, um, you know, even though they at one time thought that they would move back with the family, uh, that has changed. So now their investment is here in Tulsa. Their dreams are in Tulsa. Uh, and that is what I believe continues to push that number to grow as far as the population. Because that's not only happening here in Tulsa, it's happening in larger cities where families that at one point thought that they would move back, but now they are calling the United States their home. Uh, their dreams are now here. And, and it's interesting because, uh, for example, a family that said, I'm gonna work 10, 15 years, we're gonna go back home, buy some land, their dream is to own land, cattle, have a farm, uh, and they end up living in Chicago, for example. Uh, the years go by, they have had the opportunity to gain some wealth, but the dream is not to go back to Mexico anymore. So now we have individuals moving to a perfect city such as Tulsa, which is, it has everything you want in a city, but yet in a country environment where you can come and buy 50 acres, have a farm, have the cattle you always dreamed of. So we're seeing that shift within the United States and we're being impacted and benefited by that. Interesting. So, Jesse, you well, want to add? I was going to add the safety uh, part to the question. Um, I don't know if you remember uh, two summers ago in June when you had a huge migration of children coming to the United States. And one thing that was uh, you saw a lot in these families that were coming here is the first thing was the establishment of safety for them because at that time in El Salvador, uh, Nicaragua, one in 15, and if you have 15 kids, one was being murdered by those gangs and the drug cartels in Latin America. So mothers, fathers would load up in what they call the super train that would come up from uh, Latin America through Mexico uh, in, in heading this direction. 
to get away from that because they were told either your son or daughter joins our game or we kill you and your family. So a lot of them came here looking for that security as well as leaving places like Juarez, Mexico, where the cartels were killing upwards to 3,000 people a year. So there was a huge push to get away from that and, and be here where they can consider uh, peace and safety as part of the American dream. Interesting. So Jesse, you mentioned earlier that one of your components of your job is recruitment. Did you not? So you're out looking to bring young, younger, I guess anyone here to be a member of the police department from other states. So how do you sell? What kind of people are you looking for and how do you sell Tulsa? This city, um, once they get here, it sells itself. I mean, that's one of the things I love about recruiting out of state is people have this perception of Oklahoma if they've never been here before. So when I go to places like El Paso, Texas, and uh, they send me out uh, that far west looking for more uh, Hispanic, bicultural, bilingual officers. Um, because out there you have the first, second, and as well as San Antonio, the first, second, and third generation Hispanic American um, that has a, uh, we have a larger pool of college educated because we require a bachelor's degree. Uh, and then obviously the population uh, is a lot bigger for us to pull from. Whereas in, in Oklahoma, uh, we'll get there eventually where we have a large pool to recruit from. But if you take the medium age in the state of Oklahoma of Hispanics, from the oldest to the youngest, from Guyman to Grove, from Durant to uh, uh, Bartlesville, the medium age is 14. So they're young. And that's where we have the issue of recruiting Hispanics within here as far as getting that large pool. So we have to spend time in places like El Paso, where I will be next week for uh, almost 10 days, to visiting universities that are considered Hispanic serving institutions. Um, UTEP, which is 75% Hispanic, New Mexico State University, which is 60% Hispanic. Places like that where we'll have the four year degree, bachelor educated US citizen that it would consider moving to this part of the country um, to work for a very good police department. And it's just about exposure for them to see that we're hiring, especially now after yesterday. Thank you very much to everybody that <laughs> voted. Uh, and that, uh, that we need to take our, because right now we're at 30 Hispanic officers out of approximately 800 on our agency. Wow. So it is a, at a crisis, um, and it is something that Chief Jordan, uh, Mayor Bartlett, and City Council have all been aggressively helping me uh, address, as well as the Regional Chamber, the Hispanic Chamber, um, to get more Hispanic officers to the City of Tulsa, but it takes going out there first and then eventually we'll have the pool within our own state to, to pick from. So this idea of recruiting people to Tulsa makes me think, Francisco, about the Hispanic Chamber. And uh, I know the Re Tulsa Regional Chamber has a big role in recruiting. How about the Hispanic Chamber in terms of recruiting people? We, to do, we do get calls um, uh, about the city. Uh, like I said, we utilize the resources of the Tulsa Regional Chamber to sell Tulsa. Uh, when we get asked, uh, it's about the Hispanic community. Um, a lot of them, about, you know, about the Hispanic buying power in the state of Oklahoma, uh, which is about seven, almost $8 billion a year, by the way, Hispanic wow. buying power. Um, things like that. And, you know, and, and sometimes we do get visitors and we just kind of take them around to show them uh, some of the uh, different uh, diverse uh, businesses. And is there a, a common, or do you see a common theme of types of businesses that contact you most frequently or places that they are considering coming from to well, Oklahoma? Well, you know, I mentioned earlier that the, the Hispanic community is kind of maturing a, a bit. Uh, we've been getting calls from, um, see, there's one last week uh, wanting to expand a business in Chihuahua, Mexico and coming to Tulsa. Some, I think it was some hot dogs or something like that. In Mexico, believe it or not, but it was it was kind of a neat, and obviously we work well with San Luis Potosi, uh, Mexico, the sister city of Tulsa, uh, which we've gone to several times uh, with the Tulsa Global Alliance, and uh, established some uh, connections over there, and also from the state of Guanajuato, state of Guanajuato with Simon Navarro, that uh, also has some visitors from that state to come to Tulsa, and we just kind of uh, arrange some of the meetings with city officials, some of them uh, uh, with the Tulsa Regional Chamber, and things like that. Like that, yeah. 
So Jesse, a little bit more about your role with the Tulsa Police Department. You've got several. We've talked about the recruitment. Tell us a little bit more about some of your other roles. Uh, one of the, uh, well, I'm an instructor at the academy, and the thing that I cover uh, among many topics uh, is cultural confidence for the Hispanic community as well as language training for our cadets. Um, and, and then and the, uh, the outreach uh, liaison director. The reason the, the, uh, the outreach started for the Tulsa Police Department back in the mid-2000s, uh, around 2005 or so, 2007, I, was, I moved over to the police academy. And at that time, being a new recruiter, I thought, okay, uh, one of the things that was tasked with uh, for me was to get more Hispanics on the Tulsa Police Department. And I thought, okay, we're going to handle this from a two-pronged approach. The first is obviously spend time at Hispanic serving institutions. The second is to build the pool of local Tulsa Hispanic kids to want to do this job um, 10 years down the road once they have finished their academics. So the Tulsa Community College was having a student luncheon and uh, they bust in 400 Hispanic kids from the area to expose them to going to college uh, to careers uh, in, the, uh, in the local uh, community. And I thought, okay, this is a perfect opportunity for me to get out there in front of them, let them see a Hispanic in uniform and talk to them about this as a potential career. And uh, thinking this was going to be just great uh, as far as building that relationship with them and starting it. Well, I get out there and I have my little booth, put it together, polished it up, I was excited about it. I thought this is, this is going to be low hanging fruit. So I thought this is going to be good. And out of the 400 kids, I had one come talk to me. And this is right around the time when you had the, the politics splitting in the country that became polarizing on the immigration debate and so forth. I had one Hispanic girl, a 16 year old. They effectively did a box around my booth. They went to this booth, and then they went out, swung around, and then came to the booth next to me. With only one little girl walked up to me and point blank asks me, what are you doing here? Are you here to deport my friends? I mean, and I looked at her, I mean, I'm floored. I'm like, what do you mean? I'm here to expose you to a career in law enforcement. And he goes, well, the way we hear it, all police want to do is get us out, my family out of this country. So, as a professor laid on my shoulders one day when I went to uh, her with a problem, she said, what is your solution? And I knew, okay, we have to do something because if we don't step up to this plate, then this uh, minority community, these kids, these Hispanic American kids are becoming marginalized and they will not work with police and not look at this as a viable occupation when they finish their academics. So it was to, uh, to address the issue of how do you build rapport with a community that fears you, either by the culture, meaning in their country, many, as you have read in newspapers, uh, law enforcement officers in Mexico and other Latin American countries are in, in a sense entrepreneurs themselves. They make money off of stopping you on the street. And so they're conditioned. And this community is conditioned that when dealing with law enforcement, it is not about you broke the law, it's about how much this is going to cost me. It happens all the time. Um, so I had to, okay, how do you do that? How do you build rapport with them? And as well as get both sides to understand each other. So I decided to address this from a kind of a six component uh, outreach uh, multifaceted program. It's uh, media, which is Crime Stoppers. We have not had a Crime Stoppers in Spanish before. So let's say you get carjacked in East Tulsa, they take your car. Well, there's roughly, at any one time, 80,000 Hispanics in the Tulsa area. Many of them don't speak English or very little English. They're not gonna know either by, let's say an Amber Alert goes out or a, a press release goes out that we're looking for these people. They have no idea. So nothing was being told to them in their own language, in Spanish. Uh, Community and uh, as far as community education and law enforcement education. And what that is, is you basically educate one on the other. What does the Hispanic community think of law enforcement? What does law enforcement think of the uh, Hispanic community? And let them understand from a cultural competence standpoint. A helpline, they've never had a helpline before, so if they just call, how do I pay for a ticket? 
how do I report domestic violence, things of that nature, where they could call my office and I could at least address some of the questions that many of you already have the answer to or know they go and Google it, they don't have that technology or they don't know how to navigate it. And then the VIPS, uh, this one got some national recognition. What VIP stands for is Volunteer and Policing um, Services. And what I did there is I would go out to the community and for those that spoke both languages, that were Hispanic Americans and wanted to volunteer as a Spanish interpreter for our police department, I would recruit them to come to the police academy, we'd do a background check, um, and then I would train them on how to ride with an officer. And in turn, they would ride with an officer as a volunteer to interpret out there in the real world under real circumstances. And what that did is you have a Hispanic individual who wants to learn more about what the police department is dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, but you also have a volunteer Hispanic officer, or a volunteer officer who wants to learn Spanish. So what I requested my volunteers to do is when you guys aren't busy, will you be teaching the police officer Spanish in the police car while you're riding around? And it, it, it was a huge success, and it, I mean, it continues to grow, but that is something that has really helped in building rapport because now you have two cultures, the Hispanic culture and the police culture, learning from each other while you're on patrol. Do you need more time to answer that? No, sir, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, my bodyguard. <laughs> so one little follow-up question to that. You said there was, that that program recently received a little award. Tell us about the award. That well, one, you gave me, uh, the city uh, Tulsa Rotary Club gave me an award for Officer of the Year uh, back in uh, 2012, right? Is that when I, you guys, was, I was lucky enough to be here? It goes so fast. And uh, that was something that I was very honored and thank you for that. Um, and uh, it continues to get acclaim, uh, people across the country from, I've gotten uh, people from Oregon to New York City who call and ask, on you know, how do you develop an outreach program and how do you administer it to the Hispanic community as well as to law enforcement. So we, we, we have a lot of people asking these questions on, on building relationships with this community, uh, primarily to solve crime. And that's what I tell many in the community that it's about solving crime ultimately. It's about keeping the weak and the oppressed with the service in the job that we do and that is uh, being there for them. Um, and that's why it's important that we continue to do this type of things. Whether you're on one side or the other on the immigration debate, it ultimately affects all of us when this community is silent. Right. So, Francisco, to wrap up, tell, tell us a tad bit more about the membership of, I think you mentioned it a, a, a second ago, but your membership in the chamber and how people reach out to you. There may be some people here who might want to uh, yeah, reach out to you. We're a member-driven organization, so you know we don't get any uh, city money, state money, federal money. Uh, basically, with a membership, uh, we provide the services. We do uh, the Cinco de Mayo Festival. We do several events to, to raise money. Uh, and, but we do a lot of things in, in the community. Uh, and and I, I have to mention this. You know, One of the things that I'm very, very proud of is uh, partnering with Said Music, with Kim, uh, and starting the mariachi program in several schools in Tulsa Public Schools. And right now we're working with Union to establish the mariachi program in, in Union. We try to work with uh, uh, the youth a lot. Uh, the other two things that we're working on is uh, a group called HOT, Hispanics of Tomorrow, with uh, several high schools, and uh, most likely it would be Union, and then taken into Tulsa Public Schools. The other one, Hispanic Speakers Bureau, and that that's uh, getting uh, people like Andy and uh, Jesse going to schools as volunteer basis and, and telling their story to our youth. And so, you know, we, we do a lot in the, the community. And so membership is very important to organizations like ours because we do good things in the community. It's not just because it's me, but it's just that it's an organization and that has many volunteers to get involved in the community. And, uh, and we need new blood as well. We need young kids to get involved. Uh, in our community. Uh, that's one of the things that we're lacking a lot. So we, we try to, to mold our youth to get involved and volunteer, and not just with the Hispanic community, but the community in general. Thank you. Okay, Andy, I'm going to let you have the last word. Tell us a little bit about your, the bank's portfolio of loans and, and its business with the Hispanic community and anything else that you might want to wrap up with. Sure. Uh, it was interesting to hear uh, Jesse talk about their efforts in reaching out uh, for new uh, employees in, in the Post uh 
Paul tells the police department. Uh, the same thing uh, with us in Arvis Bank, you know, uh, trying to service our customers uh, in their language. Uh, 15, 10 years ago, we had five bilingual associates for the entire Tulsa metro area. Today, we have 80. Wow. Uh, so we are also out there recruiting young bilingual associates uh, to be able to service our community. And we've seen that growth through our loan portfolio, our deposits, uh, as far as, you know, five, again, five, ten years ago, the average uh, loan size was 15000 20000 for a business. Today, it's 500 550, they're buying their own real estate for their businesses. So we've seen that tremendous growth. And now we not only have that need for the uh, bilingual tellers or the people that open the accounts, but for mortgage lenders, commercial lenders, and so forth. So we continue to see that growth. Great. Well, we could go on and on, but we have to respect everyone's time. So let's give our panel a big thank you applause. And by the way, uh, Jesse Guardiola will be available for autographs and pictures after the uh, <laughs> event. I need to get a new bodyguard. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously they like each other a lot. Um, a, a book recognizing our program called Growing Up Pedro has been circulating and our panelists have all autographed it and signed it for the kids with words of encouragement. And I encourage you to thank the volunteers who helped make the program possible today. And again, I want to tell all three of you, Andy, Francisco, and Jesse, you'd make great Rotarians. You're, you have an open invitation. And if we can't get you in, you're certainly welcome to be a guest anytime you would like. And with that, we're adjourned.